Welcome to episode six of Robo Weekly. Welcome to episode six. Dan, how are you doing? I'm good. Six, six, anything for six? What do you got for me? Sure. Six. Let's see. One plus two plus three equals six, and one times two times three equals six. What three other? Three factorial. Love three factorial. Uh, is six. I guess it is three factorial. But are there yep. other numbers for which that would be true? Uh, no, I can't think of one. I think uh, zero. Uh, uh, Negative what, six. <clears throat> Uh, I'm not quite sure if they were good for that one. Anyway, let's move forward because I would like to address an issue with our comments. Um, <coughs> we've been getting a lot of views, not a lot of comments. So what we're going to do is we're going to give away from last week's comments a free T-shirt. Free T-shirt. Can you see what mm. the T-shirt is, Dan? I'll give you a clue. Yeah, I think it's Voight. from uh, Blade Runner. Yeah, Void Camp Test. It is the Void Camp Test. Right. Um, and so from last week, we have at LearnMax. If at LearnMax can send us an email with his address, you will get the Voight Camp T-shirt. Please comment. We'll send you a T-shirt if we like your comment. Lucky winner. Moving forward. Moving forward. Okay, let's start talking about Robo News as a, that is what we are. Just a quick comment. We do work for a company um, which will change its name to Tyco Bot, um, but this is not an information, so we will not be talking about our product, except maybe at the end when it's time for us to. But we really are a Robo News show, so let's talk about the Robo News from the last seven days. If we can bring up the first slide. So we're looking at a suite of products here from a company called Neura. Um, I want to specifically talk about stuff that's going to be in the home. Um, obviously, 90% of the robot business is industrial. But let's take a look at that one at the end. Um, it's starting to look a lot like ours. It rolls along. It's got two arms. Um, the interesting thing here is they have a subscription model. So they mm -hmm. want you to charge by the month. And it's going to be interesting to see how these things are going to get paid for. Dan, what do you think of Neura? uh she looks good um what's its reach can it reach the floor can it reach up to a shelf good question one doesn't of, one of the doesn't main look things like it can reach the floor to me i don't see any elevator there i don't no i would say it cannot reach not that one on the end which is right. the other ones are industrial ones so uh good point um and the cost is so high i'm certainly not going to be banging on about cost and availability like i did last week but the cost is so high that they're introducing the the business model where you pay by the month and save yeah. money on what it might that's say. A, so that's an interesting business model, and we'll see we'll see how right. these things do actually get paid for. Um, isn't, isn't that what Ford did uh, for the Model T? Well, I mean, uh, you know, when you have these high ticket items, financing is really the only way you can right. get people to pay for it. So there's, you know, you either get them to pay a subscription and you give them a free one, or they finance yeah. it and keep it. I mean, it's one of the two. Because look, you got to have a house, a car, and a robot. That I would now agree with you. Let us take a look at uh, our second uh, topic of discussion for today, Escape. Oh, okay. I know these guys. Yeah, they just raised $78 million. Wow. Yeah, I That's... happen to know uh, a guy who works there. Um, uh, they've been working on it for a while. My, my concern about it is, you know, bringing a robot close to a human being seems a little bit fraught. Uh, I'm sure they've thought that through and they have uh, some sort of... Uh, you know, have to. Uh, argument as to why it's safe. But um, I I mean, I, I'd love to get a massage every day, but I'm not sure I would trust a robot to not screw that up. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, I think I would probably put that under the category of stuff that will eventually get solved. Um, right. But now may not be the time. But the interesting thing is, is that it's... Um, it's uh, it raised a lot of money, which which yeah. we know what that means. That there's, there's, right, there's but it's, money it's not a humanoid. It's 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 a very uh, task specific robot. That's right. In fact, th there was another task specific robot I was going to include today, which I didn't, which was a robotic catheter, which can navigate oh. its way through your veins. But I decided to leave that one out because yeah. I thought everyone would wince. Thank you. Uh, let's move on to the third one, talking about wincing. Um, so Ooh. this one is uh, is a partnership from Inos and uh, Ugo. Inos provides the nose. It's a smelling robot. Ugo provides all that wow. stuff at the bottom that can sort of wander around and do stuff. Um, you can see it does have an elevator, so it can reach the floor. But specifically, it can smell VOCs, volatile organic compounds. It can smell COVID-19, y kind of stuff. Um, Hold on so a it's sec. A, yeah. Why do you need something that looks like a human face to have a smell detector? We have a smoke so detector. It doesn't have a face. No, so uh, carbon monoxide detectors don't have faces. I'm guessing 
that the top face is irrelevant and that the <laughs> INOS technology can work wherever it wants to work. There's no right. reason it should have a face. And in fact, with the, par the first partnership it's announced with Ugo, I guess one of them has two eyes. I wouldn't call it a face. But it's the, the point here is, is that... It, they put their smell sensor on the robot. Exactly. It's just, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's another, it's, it's another uh, IO thing for the robot in this particular right. case. industrial thing, I'm not quite sure um, if smell sensor would be useful in a, in a consumer setting. You know, mm, this tomato sauce is good. I'm not quite sure. Um, maybe it might be able to deconstruct recipes and stuff. But... <laughs> Let's take a look at the fourth one. We're going to go down, 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 down in price. Down below us. Hmm. This is called Bracket. What is this? Bracket. Bracket? Oh, this is the, an open Waterloo. source thing? He's a student from the University of Waterloo. It's basically a, a kit that he sells that you can use for you know doing research. It's $5.99. It hmm. works on um, those wheels that you balance on. I forgot what they're called. The right. Like wheels. a hoverboard thing. Yeah. Like it's got, so it's got hoverboard wheels, a Raspberry Pi, and it's got a motor that comes out of a, uh, like a, like a rotary drill. And that is it. And what does the motor do? I mean, what uh, can it do? It has no hands or arms. Right. So it's got no hands. It's got no arms. So basically all it can do at five ninety nine is walk around the house, <laughs> answering questions, listening to you and maybe looking at stuff. So basically, oh, so, I would describe this. So when we talk about minimum viable robot, this is his minimum viable robot. But what it actually yeah. is, is a movable Alexa. It's an Alexa on wheels. It's right, nothing more than right. Wheels. So, you it, know, th it, could maybe, of... it could maybe do some security patrolling. Mm -hmm. You know, I could see that. But in terms of in terms of manipulating objects, no. But this, pretty, so, I would say, I mean, is this an MVR to you? Uh, I, I worry about the V part of that. Um, I was just going to say briefly, there's, um, th there was a thing a few years ago, and I actually work uh, at a company that put one of these products out that were like telepresence robots, you know, with a base and like a, a video screen and a camera. And uh, I had a friend who uh, worked at Google, and he was using it to log in from some remote location. And eventually, Sergey uh, Brin came to him and said, uh, or Larry Page, or whoever was running uh, Google at that time came to him and said, like, you know, stop at the robot. It's just distracting. So <laughs> it didn't really end up working. But well, this reminds me of that time, because Yeah, well, times times change fast, that's for sure. Yeah. So bracket. So, you know, last last week we talked about how expensive everything is. This one is is yeah, a minimum robot below ours. You have a problem with the V part, which I think I'll agree with you. Right. Just um, but I, I, mean, I like may, it. And, and, maybe it's a basis, you know, the, I mean, these bracket systems, these, uh, these iframes, you can, you, you can add, uh, components pretty easily. Uh, you can, so it, it might be, it might be a framework for something to build on. Right. Uh, let, let's move into the fifth one. The fifth one is, um, we've got, is a YouTube video. Um, this one's called Felix. Um, okay. again, it's an expensive robot. Again, as you can see, it's, uh, looks like it's in an industrial environment. Um, but, uh, it's on an elevator. It's got two arms. You yeah. know, we're starting to see stuff look very similar now. Uh, yeah. elevator for getting up and down. Um, yep. That looks like it's using a, a, a vision. I would suspect yeah. it's using some sort of vision, uh, action model. So what's the uh, name of the company? Reflex? Re Reflex. And I believe this one also, uh, is charging on a per hour saved basis. So huh. I don't know if you recall, we saw that, um, uh, 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 pl wall plastering robot at one point, and right. on that one they charged on how much you would save on human labor. I believe this is the same business model. Right. Uh, it's a little uh, anthropomorphism there. It's wiping its shoulder. You like you like reflex. Obviously, it's, oh, it's definitely a robot, a minimum viable robot. Yeah, it seems uh, seems pretty cool. Let's let's take a look at our last one for today. Is the Helix? Ah. Uh. I thought you'd like this because it's in the kitchen. Yeah, yeah. I think I might have seen this a while ago. Um, Do we have I sound? Guess, I would guess it's not cheap, and I would guess it's not available, but it's pretty nice. And the company is named Helix? Yeah, I've got Helix down here. I believe the company is called Helix. Um, uh, we've got four fingers. Um, what else is it going to do for us here? Um, Do you have legs? No, but you know what this one is? I do remember it does have legs, and this one is using the VLA architecture, which we talked about last week. Right. So this one is now starting to talk to, to use vision language action models. So I believe right. that's why this one is is, is quite relevant. Yep. 
Um, okay, so we, we've talked about what's happening, and as we can see, we're sort of reaching a, a little bit of a convergence. We, we talked about it last week, you know, uh, after CES, where we had that sort of flurry of home robots. We're now sort of settling back into into the stuff that's going to make money, which is the stuff on factory floors and these and these ideals of what might happen in the house. Of course, our right. goal is to bring these ideals to people's homes earlier yeah. than everybody else. I'd like to talk this week about form factor. Mm -hmm. um, I'd like to ask you why everybody's talking about humanoids. Um, right. And the, and the basic question is, well, is, is, is should we build a robot that, that, that fits into the world that we built for ourselves for bipeds? Or should we be designing the world differently so that we don't have to have robots that look like humanoids? No, well, I think yes and. Um, I think there's a place for both approaches. So you have to define your task landscape. You know, if you're in a warehouse, it's one thing. If you're in a, a home, it's another thing. Um, you know, I don't see the benefit of, of a legged robot in the home in terms of the, you know, insane amount of cost that it would be to do that and the simplicity of using wheels. The problem is, of course, stairs. Uh, there might be a way of getting around that, but... Um, I don't know. I mean, you know, the argument that you'll read if you read, you know, blogs and podcasts from people talking about this is, you know, the, the world we built is built for humans. So a human robot uh, fits into that world better than anything else. Um, I think you do have issues with the uncanny valley, you know, and what well, they what I what they do with faces slightly. is kind of interesting. I can rephrase so, it slightly. Um, if you were to build a, um, a warehouse, uh, a novel yeah. environment, not the home um, uh, that didn't have any legacy attached to it, like the home does, which is built for humans. If you were to build a factory to do right. a task, um, would you build the factory specifically because a specific kind of robot would make it easier? In other words, would the tail wag the dog? Um, should we build I, facilities and experiences specifically right. because we can get a robot to do it better as opposed to the other way around well i think i think it's it's again specific to the to the task and you'd have to do a formula of cost saved you know uh, I, I know anecdotally having been involved in this business for a while that amazon was all go on like you know redesigning their warehouses for some simple robots to work with and i think they did that actually they they bought a company i think called kiva this is like 15 years ago um my understanding is that we're moving away from that paradigm because the cost of, of building a new facility and the sales cycle, if you think about it from the robotics people's point of view, you know, you've got customers who are going to take three to five years to like build a new warehouse. I mean, uh, what are you going to tell your investors? Right. No, so, let me put it a different way. Let me put it a different way. We're seeing robots now and we just saw three robots, I think now reaching into a dishwasher and taking yeah. something out of a dishwasher. Yeah. Why should, the dishwasher be there. Why shouldn't the dishwasher and the robot be integrated? Why does the robot have to start working with the or even the sink and even the faucet? Because you Why already any... have because you have those things. Those things exist, and there's an infrastructure for selling and installing and maintaining those systems. And if you create a whole new system, this is this gets back to Jeffrey Moore and the crossing the chasm and the early adopter thing. You can't expect late adopters to like just move to a new house. Or you know, spend six months and fifty thousand dollars retrofitting their house for, uh, you know, because the robot can't get up the stairs, no, I, right? I think retrofitting is not what you know. Uh, you know, retrofitting is always more expensive. By the way, do you remember in the uh, in the seventies, all the houses had uh, central vacuum and clean, like cleaning? Had yeah, a central yeah, and that didn't work out too well, did it? No, sort of reminds me a little bit of that. No, no, I don't right. think anything is going to be retrofit. But what I'm talking about is, is that for instance, when the next generation of washing machines comes out, right, they'll be redesigned in order for no i disagree i think what will happen is when the next uh, batch of uh washing machines comes out they will talk to the robot and there will be interaction over wi-fi or bluetooth and there will be coordination of of duties you know so and, for you uh, interlacing is more in terms of in the communication between the things right not so right. much in, in integrated right. manufacturing physical form it. factor i mean you know the, the industry is going to have all sorts of form factors Right. I mean, look, look at how many different cars you have, you know, half of which are really trucks in, in the U.S. at least. Uh, you know, there's going to be somebody's going to want, uh, you know, I, I know someone who has a commercial uh, 
dishwasher that costs ten thousand dollars and washes the dishes in seven minutes you know i i don't know if it needs to be operated differently than a normal dishwasher but again i think i think you're going to have internet of thing kind of connections between these systems uh you know so like you could have visual feedback from the robot's point of view of looking at the sink and saying this stuff has been in the sink too long it's going to stick to the pan we're going to do a pots and pans cycle you know with with a longer cycle and hotter water and a different kind of detergent like that's right. the kind of integration I see happening. All right, I have to say I, I I see it slightly differently as a as an ex real estate developer. Right. I see building a house, building an apartment that has a central rail going down the middle where a robot <laughs> thing can exist, and and we yeah. design around the robot. Again, that's I think that things you know there is going to be an interlacing. How it's going to happen, we will find right. out. That will be the well, interesting we, thing. We, um, we I think agree. we pretty much covered um, a, a, a lot of what we wanted to cover today um in terms of what's happened this week we've talked about why people use humanoid form factors and whether that's going to continue uh we've talked about why people aren't leaving any comments on our website but we're getting tons of views uh but we love that people are watching it we hope this is useful to people and um we hope to see you all next week thank you for watching six six